Thank you so much for tuning in and welcome everyone. I hope you're well. I'm your host, Ben Lively, and you're listening to Shaken Awake, episode number 34. I just wanted to thank you for tuning in wherever you are and whatever you're doing right this very moment. Uh, Looks like we have some new listeners from South Africa tuning in with us, so welcome aboard. Thank you for listening, and we're certainly honored to have you with us. And as always, I promise you another great show, but more than anything, my hope for you today and always is that you have an actual encounter with the Lord. He's always right there beside you. And if you find any value in these episodes, the greatest thank you of all uh, is to pass the word to at least one person you know to help spread the word and uh, allow them a shot to, to listen uh, to the words that we speak here. And I want to give a shot, uh, shout out to our uh, Strong Christian Men's Group on Facebook, known as Men Who Follow Christ. And it's growing uh, by leaps and bounds. And if you're a man of God or striving to be one, join us today on the Facebook group, Men Who Follow Christ. And although this group is for men, we do recognize the need for women to have a place like this. So we definitely support our sister page at www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the weeping women of Christ. Uh, So without further ado, let's get ready to invite God in with us right here, right now and allow him uh, to speak directly to your hearts and minds. So here goes. Here is today's topic. It's been discovered the one thing that God left out of the Bible, and it's your opinion. So for those of you, I hope that's the majority of you who listen to my very uh, first podcast episode, you know that I lived a life that more or less resembled the life of Saul of Tarsus, if not worse. Uh, You know how God delivered me out of the worst afflictions I could ever imagine one having and pulling me out of the fire uh, I should still be burning in for eternity. You know where I've been and, and know where I'm at now. And I say this to set the stage and I'm far from perfect, far from living a perfect godly life and no different than any of you listening. Why? Because the Bible says that. I don't claim to be anything that God says I'm not. Or that God doesn't say that I am. I sin. I repent. I pray. I worship. I love the Lord. And I'm learning how to love people all over the world. And it's a daily work in progress from above. So what I'm discovering is so much angst, anger, division, frustration, arguing, divisiveness, accusing, blaming, shunning, and just plain hatred in the body of Christ that I never knew existed. And it seems to be getting worse by the week, at least from what I'm witnessing. So uh, this is now a surprise as as this was already, uh, this is not a surprise, I'm sorry, as this was already prophesied by Jesus as he and when he described to his disciples how we would be in the last days. Nevertheless, it's still shocking and uh, and saddening to see and witness. Uh, We've been warned in the Bible repeatedly about the wolves in in sheep's clothing. And we're experiencing that scene now like never before. And I think what's most worrisome, however, is the fact that feelings and opinions are now superseding God's word in many of the disputes within the church. And I'm going to show just a few scriptures to back these statements up so that it's not me making the statement, but rather God. I'm, 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 I'm seeing the body or the claiming body of Christ claiming things that are not in the Bible, but that are born from their own ignorance, their own opinions, their own feelings, and their own understandings. So what's happening is many are turning their backs to the very word of God that called them to begin with. They're doing what the Israelites did for so many years in the desert by falling away from what they knew and defaulting to what they felt should be. And if you don't know or haven't read in some time, it never worked out for them. In fact, it always led to their defeat, their death, and prevention of true repentance and salvation. We're doing the very same thing, guys, except it's just a different point on the timeline. You know, when you replace God's word with your own version, you become your own God. In fact, you place yourself above God and his word. 
the one that also did that was Satan himself for this very pride caused his fall and removal from heaven along with a third of the angels who were with him in his thinking and pride. Well, why do we do this? Why do we feel we know better than God? Why do we feel that we can justify what we do, what we think, what we feel or act by something that is more right or quote unquote justified than the very creator who created us? You know, that may not be your conscious intention, but that is what you're doing, regardless of intent. And there, there's an old saying that holds no more or less true with this subject than any other. And that is the pathway to hell is often paved with the best of intentions. So that makes it just a little bit harder to control and prevent, right? Because you believe your heart is in the right place, but your mind's not. From what comes out of a man's mouth defiles him for it comes from the heart. Well, where's your heart at today? Is it in lockstep with Christ? Or is it in lockstep with you and your current direction in life? Where do you dwell? In God's word, which reveals all things and is truly living? Or by your perception of what is or what shouldn't be? You know, this is important. The Bible says it's important. In fact, it's ironic that most that state the Bible is infallible and perfect in its writing and meaning are more likely and often to use their perceptions and own understandings to win the arguments over what's right and wrong, what should or should not be, and what God says and what he means versus what he does not. How many of you are with me on this? Do you, do you understand what's happening? Are you following me on this? Are you nodding your head? Are you shaking your head? Or are you just completely puzzled by what I'm saying here? I'm going to give you a couple of more recent examples of arguments, battles, uh, fights, and sin I'm, I've seen recently and what the Bible says or doesn't say or what the word of God means versus what it doesn't mean. And see if this or any of these resonate with you. Um, timing of the rapture. Tribulation timeline. Once saved, always saved. Verse not. L loss of salvation. What's a true Christian versus a false one? Old Testament versus New Testament theology. Does God change with the times? True repentance versus regret and remorse. The word of Jesus and his disciples, was it for their time or ours or both? A loving God versus a judging God. Loss of salvation versus salvation that can never be taken. Name, can it be blotted out of the Lamb's book of life? Predestination and election. God created the men and women knowing they would not be saved in the end homosexuality and being a Christian at the same time. Someone that believes in Christ, as John 3, 16 states, is saved forever regardless of how they live their life. The spirit, the scriptures being literal or are they figurative? Man took away or added to the scriptures and so unsure of what to believe or not? Watering down the severity of sin from what the Bible denotes? misunderstandings of our role on earth once we're born again. What a born again Christian is like versus one that claims they're saved and believe. That somehow there's a different level or levels of Christianity and being saved. That some of the Bible is meant for us and some is not, or some's even obsolete. Going with what man states rather than what the word of God states. Leaning on our pastors for wisdom versus the Bible. The Trinity, no such thing, verse, it's an absolute, backed up by the word of God. Complying with what's convenient and comfortable while ignoring what's not. Seeing God only as love but not the judge, or seeing God as only the judge but not love. Seeing Jesus as the loving Messiah, but God is the one that is angry and the deciding factor of who goes to hell and who doesn't. The skin color of Jesus, the shape of the earth. The role of the government versus God. What feels right and wrong versus what God says. Mark of the beast. And who's our neighbors, quote unquote, that we're to love at Jesus, as Jesus commands is the second greatest commandment. Guys, I could go on for hours and still not even scratch the surface. How does the proclaimed body of Christ claim it's the body of Christ when we can't even agree on what the very word of God says? 
The inheritance of the kingdom is not a buffet style a la carte menu of do's and don'ts. The Bible's very clear on what we must all do to be truly saved, born again, worshiping and praising of God, prayer, faith, love, loving God and our neighbors as ourselves, being servants, being the head and not the tail, and not leaning on our own wisdom as fools do, but by clinging to every word of God. Why do we have the instruction manual for life and eternity that has outlived everything since before Christ was born, but we aren't smart or wise enough to believe everything from the first to the last page, the way God and the Holy Spirit designed it? The reason you can't answer that is because there's no true answer. It's a fallacy, except this kind can cost you true belief, true direction for your life, and whether or not you steer others toward or away from the very God you claim to belong to and love with all your heart, mind, soul, and body. So here's a couple verses I picked out, and some may be recognizable to you, some may be new to you. Proverbs 14, 12 said, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Proverbs 28, 26, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, But he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make make straight your paths. That's Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. So when the Bible tells us in this verse not to lean on our own understanding, it's not encouraging us to be irrational. You know, the Bible puts up no wall of separation between our intellect and and faith. In fact, the book of Proverbs speaks very highly of understanding. Proverbs 2 2, incline your heart to understanding. 2 3 says, raise your voice for understanding. Proverbs 2 11, understanding will guard you. Proverbs 3 13, blessed is the one who gets understanding. Proverbs 14 33, wisdom rests in the heart of a man of understanding. Proverbs 15 14, the heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge. Proverbs 16, 16, to get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. And Proverbs 23, 23, by wisdom, instruction, and understanding. So if we're supposed to get understanding, why are we not supposed to lean on it? I'm going to ask that again. If we're not supposed to get understanding, why are we not supposed to lean on it? What we're told not to lean on is our own understanding meaning conclusions based primarily on our own perceptions because our own understanding simply will not bear the full weight of reality. It was never intended to. And it's the insanity of trusting ourselves. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden, right? The one tree in the garden that humans were forbidden to eat was not, interestingly, the tree of life. That's Genesis 2.9. It was not life that God denied human beings. He prohibited them to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's Genesis 2, 17. The point of this uh, prohibition was not to keep humans ignorant, but to preserve us for the pleasures of this world. If, If it was not as if, it was if God was saying, if you eat of that tree, you'll be saying to me, I'm smarter than you. I'm more authoritative than you. I'm wiser than you are. I think I can care for myself better than you care for me. You're not a very good father. And so I'm going to reject you. So don't eat from the tree because you'll be rejecting me and all my good gifts and all my wisdom and all my care. Instead, keep on submitting to my will. Keep on affirming my wisdom. Keep on being thankful for my generosity. Keep on trusting me as a father and keep on eating from these other trees as a way of enjoying me. You see, in order to handle the knowledge of good and evil, one must possess A, the ability to completely comprehend all possible options and possibilities which is known as omniscience. B, the righteousness and wisdom to choose the right course. And C, the power to make reality conform to the right course, which is omnipotence. In other words, only God can handle such knowledge. What this means is that it's not the one who trusts in the Lord that's irrational, but the one who leans on his or her own understanding. It is insane to trust such pathetically limited understanding when one can trust the unlimited understanding of God. So many of the things that cause us the most difficulty and heartache in life 
and the source of so much of our anxiety, our fear, doubt, and anger with others and with God is the result of leaning on our own understanding. God doesn't want us to be miserable, even in this fallen and and evil age. He wants to relieve our anxiety, as it states in Luke 12, 11 to 12 and Philippians 4, 6 to 7. He wants to relieve our fear, as it states in Psalms 118, 6 and 1 Peter 3, 6. He wants to relieve our doubt, as it states in Matthew 21, 21 and Luke 24, 38. He wants to relieve us of our sinful anger as it states in Ephesians 4.31. And so he gives us Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 as a priceless gift. In exercising faith, which is trusting fully in the Lord and not leaning on our own understanding, we're not setting aside our intellect. We're resting our intellect upon the intellect of God. Nothing is wiser or saner. To do so is to allow him to direct our paths, which not only lead to ultimate joy, but also make the journey itself even with, even when laden with sorrow and joyful, as it states in 2 Corinthians 6.10. And it preserves us for, for us, for all the pleasures God provides us in the world. And to not do this is the height of foolishness and the path to misery, I'm telling you. So let us choose joy today by not leaning on our own understanding, but in sweet childlike uh, trust on the sure footing of our loving creator's wisdom. And additionally, you know, I was uh, convicted again just the other day. I love being lovingly corrected by God as to steer me away from what I call the edge of that narrow path. I was reminded by the Holy Spirit. And so that's especially the moments and messages that I like to share with you, the body as well. And that was as 2 Timothy 2, 23 to 25 states, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels and the Lord's servants must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. Let me give you another passage I was given. Avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn him a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him. You may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. That can be found in Titus 3, 9 to 11. And lastly, Galatians 5, 15. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, Watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So the only way you will have the knowledge is by following the very words of God. It's up to God to bring wisdom to the willing and to help the unprideful understand his true word, not you. As the scripture I just read states, we're told specifically to warn a divisive person once and even a second time, but after that, have nothing to do with them. There's nothing left to discretion or misunderstanding on that unless your pride kicks in and changes the very words of God. Otherwise, that's our directive and following its imperative to our being a good and faithful servant, no? In the notes from today, just take any of the bulleted issues that the body and proclaiming body of Christ argues about today and simply search search Google for Bible verses dealing with the subject. I'm going to post them in the notes. All the bulleted issues that we're seeing and hearing about, and there's many more. Don't take man's word, but by every word spoken in the book of God that deals on each subject. This way, you no longer lean on your own understanding, but on the understanding of the one who created everything, including the words and the meaning of every sentence in the Bible. Seek him and you shall find him. This includes his spoken word. It's alive and true from before the earth was even formed. So my fa- my my final statement to you is this. My guess is that like me, you've been wrong or off on many many things your entire life. Some small, some big, And the fact that you found out and then were able to gain the true understanding finally made all the difference. All much as as much as no longer being wrong about any given topic. So once you sought the truth, you found the truth. 
But up until that point, you believed you were right, but you were wrong. You and I were living by an untruth. So my final question to you is then this, how possible it is then that we're the same way with the very word of God we claim to love and worship and follow. Before we claim we love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and body, we have to know him. The only way to do so is to have a personal relationship with him, which which starts with his word. Read it, dwell in it, absorb it, believe it, rest on it, acknowledge it as the only truth in this world that you can and should ever count on to continue on the narrow path that leads to ever, everlasting life. Don't allow another day to go by walking in the dark while professing to live in the light. What don't you know right now about God and his word? What are you waiting for? So before we end today's show, I just want to thank you all again for tuning in. I hope you were touched by today's message and scriptures. I'd like to ask you a favor only if you received any value out of today's show. Would you tell at least one person you know? Just call them, text them, IM them, PM them, email them, talk to them. Tell them to give the show a listen. And you can check out the show at shaken-awake.com. You can email me directly at ben at shaken-awake.com or call or text me directly for any reason at 407-493-3208. Again, that number is 407-493-3208. And if you have any ideas for the show or would like to be on the show, let me know. I'd love I'd love to uh, speak further on that. So next week... Tune in next Sunday or whenever you're able as we dive into another important topic of our day, which is what matters most to God? Does it matter most to you? Next week's episode is another powerful and do not miss episode. Thank you all for joining. And until next week, take great care of yourself and each other. And God bless you all. 